Well, welcome to the second part of Dry Dock episode 204. So let's go straight on with more questions. John Edward Dietz asks, Now I know usually if you can make a surface spherical, it should be stronger than a flat surface. But with that being said, for American heavy cruisers, did the blocky designs of the New Orleans and other following classes offer better protection and functionality than the more aesthetically pleasing turrets of the Portland and Northampton classes? Well, I must admit it's the first time I've heard the older US heavy cruiser turrets being described as aesthetically pleasing, but nonetheless, um, the main reason for the change and the biggest difference is that the older Portland and Northampton style turrets, which you can see here, are absolutely massive. And as a result, for that reason amongst others, they're not particularly well protected. Um, they can probably keep out 6-inch gunfire at extreme range, but anything heavier than that, so 8-inch gunfire generally, or 6-inch gunfire at close to medium range, is going to go pretty much straight through them. And the New Orleans class turrets, and subsequent ones, whilst they are a bit more blocky, a bit more slab-sided, believe it or not, they are also actually considerably smaller, which allows their armour thickness on the face to be considerably thicker because they've saved weight elsewhere. I mean, the New Orleans class had a bunch of other weight savings incorporated as well to allow them to incorporate better protection, but reducing the sizes of the gun houses on the turrets was one of the major ones. You can see here from with this uh, turret slewed almost 90 degrees to port just how long those turrets were, and actually, also, re relatively speaking, how tall. Whereas if you look at pictures of the New Orleans class, you'll see the overall footprint of the turret is much, much smaller. So whilst being on an older US cruiser, you'd have a lot more room inside the turret to play with, which you know has certain comfort and quality of life, uh, performance enhancing it, uh, factors, especially for long duration engagements. On the other hand, as I said, if you get hit in one of those turrets, you're most likely dead. Whereas if you take a, a full frontal hit in a New Orleans class turret, unless it's at very close range with a relatively large weapon, you'll probably be okay. Eric J. Van Dooting asks, How did the First London Naval Treaty handle limitations on seaplane tenders? They don't seem to fit the London definition of a carrier, since planes can't land on them, but also would not be excluded as auxiliaries, since they would vol uh, violate multiple limits of Article 8, Section C, such as number of aircraft launching apparatus, number of aircraft, and likely their maximum speed. The answer is that they were basically a loophole in the treaty. <laughs> Something that I don't know whether it was there purposefully or accidentally, but it was still a loophole because the Article 8 section that you refer to is talking about auxiliaries, um, as you said, but the seaplane tenders were fully commissioned warships, so they're not auxiliaries. So technically speaking, the Article 8 restrictions don't apply to them or at least that section of them. And then when you look elsewhere, as you said, they're, they're not aircraft carriers by the legal definition. They're not cruisers. They're not destroyers. They, they're just not classified under the either the Washington or the London Naval Treaties. And so various nations saw them as potential get-arounds. Uh, I mean, the British probably would have built some if they'd had the, if the Royal Navy had been given the budget for it. The US Navy at various points thought about and did build a number of seaplane tenders, but they thought of it as they thought of them as a way to kind of not not as second class aircraft carriers, but they thought of them as ways to rapidly establish forward air bases because the seaplane tender could carry a number of aircraft and of course all the supplies on weapons and crew, etc. So the idea was in the Pacific you could send a seaplane tender out to some small atoll or something, i.e. a safe anchorage, deploy all your aircraft, and then suddenly you had a little, basically a little miniature waterborne airbase, complete with support facilities. And as we know with the Japanese, they specifically built most of their seaplane tenders in the interwar period with a direct view to easily converting them into small aircraft carriers, again, as a, a, a definite workaround to the London treaties, uh, well, and the Washington Treaty as well, for that matter. So, yeah, it, it was a bit of an oversight within the treaty system, although, as I say, whether or not that was um, an accident where everybody missed it, 
or whether it was everybody deliberately ignored it in the hopes of each exploiting it is another matter entirely. Chris asks, are there any books or easy to access resources, i.e. where I don't have to travel to a library or museum in person, about the American Navy during the War of 1812, not just the tactics in specific battles, but how it was run, etc.? Or did it just follow the British model? So, Naval History and Heritage Command, that's found at history.navy.mil, actually has some very nice resources for the War of 1812. There is the standard battle stuff that you'd expect, uh, but they also have a bunch of other articles. Um, so you can, there's some essays, there's uh, the Navy regulations, so you can definitely get an idea about how it was organised from those. And so that's definitely worth a look. But when it comes to books about the naval aspect of the War of 1812, you do have to be somewhat careful. Um, because, well, it's a very emotive subject, um, perhaps more so on the US side of the Atlantic than the British, although British publications on the war are not <laughs> immune to some heavy bias at times. But, well, fortunately, you can usually tell by looking at the blurb on the back whether or not it's going to be any good. Basically, I would steer clear of any th an anything published from the US side that contains phrases about how the US Navy won the War of 1812 or how the US Navy led the nation to victory in the War of 1812 because, uh, much as I hate to break it to you, the US Navy and the USA as a whole did not win the War of 1812. Um, that's not to say it was an overwhelming victory for the British either, but from a looking at it from a purely naval perspective, uh, the end of the War of 1812, which obviously paradoxically carries forward into 1814, ends with a number of captures of US Navy ships and the US Navy effectively blockaded into place, which is not really anybody's definition of victory. That's not to detract from all the other stuff they did manage to accomplish, you know, the various famous battles, Guerrier, Java, uh, Macedonian, etc. But you do have to take a slightly more balanced view. Now, with that in mind, if you want some decent books on with the War of 1812 that more more reflect some of what you were talking about, then I would recommend four books. So there's The War of 1812 and the Rise of the US Navy by Jenkins and Taylor. There's Ships of Oak, Guns of Iron, The War of 1812 and the Forging of the American Navy by Ronald Utt. And Inside the US Navy of 1812 to 1815 by William S. Dudley. That last one I would especially recommend for the interest that you've expressed because it goes into the logistics and operations and running of the US Navy in huge detail. And then finally, um, one which I always have to recommend for the War of 1812, which is The Challenge, Britain Against America in the Naval War of 1812 by, of course, none other than Professor Andrew Lambert, because he goes into extensive detail from both sides' perspective of you know, what happened and how. So, um, yeah, he, he doesn't pull his punches when it comes to where the British failed early on, but he also doesn't pull his punches when he points out where various elements of the Royal Navy gained ascendancy in the later part of the war. And unlike almost all other books about the War of 1812, with the exception of the one by uh, William Dudley, he also goes quite extensively into how this affected merchant shipping and the effects on the general economy and how the the ways that the two different navies were run actually contrasted with each other. Because, of course, the US Navy did have its, its origins to a certain degree in the way the Royal Navy was run, for obvious reasons. America had been a British colony, but by the time of the War of 1812, the Royal Navy was a fleet of hundreds upon hundreds i think something like 800 plus ships the u.s navy had a few dozen total and you know obviously in terms of rated ships few, fewer still than that and so you just cannot run organizations at those different scales in quite the same way um, there was a lot more top-down interference for example in the u.s navy as to the exact choices of captains and um, what they were going to be doing because there just wasn't you know with the royal navy the admiralty couldn't afford to be micromanaging every single action of every single captain and every single ship in the royal navy because there just wasn't enough hours in the day 
Whereas if you've only got six frigates and a handful of smaller um, sort of sixth rates and, and below, you can <laughs> if you're the nascent US Admiralty and also the US government. So there are some differences, but at the same time, there are also still a fair degree of similarities. But obviously, I say read those to get a general idea of, of the subject you're talking about. And if you had to narrow it down to two, then I would get the inside the US Navy of 1812 to 1815 by Dudley and then the challenge as kind of the contrasting companion piece. Vintage Car History asks, Rat guards are conical metal guards tied to mooring lines, which in theory keep rats from scurrying up the lines and onto the ship. What are the origins of these devices? Rat guards are actually fairly recent. They can come in conical or disc-shaped form, um, as <laughs> seen here with the stand-in rubber rat, but um, they basically don't exist for the majority of the seafaring time span of human civilization. Um, initially, people didn't care, and then even afterwards, it was just an accepted fact of life. Yes, ships came with rats, and um, rats may board the ship at different ports. That's why you had cats or dogs aboard to control the population. It was only really in the early 20th century when people started really worrying about the presence of rats on ships. And so, as far as I can tell at least, the earliest rat guards of this kind of type were beginning to see use in some merchant ships in the 1930s and 1940s, although obviously there was a rather large distraction in the middle of all of that which mitigated against um, low-level innovations of this kind being particularly widespread. And then uh, as you get into the post-World War II period they become more and more common. Um, there's various records and various patent offices of rat guards um, going well, such as you, you can patent a, a metal disc with a slot cut in it, um, but I'm sure someone did. Uh, and anyway, these kind of things they show up in patent office ideas from sort of the late 40s, early 50s onwards, with some of them being granted in the 60s. So they're actually a fairly modern invention. A Voyage Schisnos asks, You've mentioned in several dry docks and other videos that Germany and the United States both struggled with building turbine engines in the 1900s. What is it about turbine engines that made them so difficult to make? It was a combination of a couple of different factors. First of all, they were pretty new, and the guy who invented them was in Britain. And, you know, when something brand new is invented, even these days in a very globalised market, it usually takes a few months to a few years, depending on how complex something is for other people to come up with an equivalent that works just as well. And bearing in mind that when you're talking about something like naval propulsion, you do need something that works almost or just as well. You can't make do with something that works 20 or 30% as well, because that's kind of pointless. Um, so and uh, that's in today's environment where the ability to purchase, take apart and uh, re-engineer something is relatively easy to do, assuming you don't care about certain copyright laws. Um, whereas back in the early 20th century, in the 1900s, well, there were only so many Parsons turbines in existence, and Parsons could keep a fairly close eye on where they went. Plus, as you can see from this example, admittedly this is a uh, slightly later example on HMS Belfast, but the principles are still the same. It's actually a very complex bit of machinery. So if you look at a vertical triple expansion engine, there's a few fine detail parts, but the main moving parts are actually fairly chunky. They have to be ma precisely machined, but they're fairly, fairly large. Whereas with a turbine engine, each of those blades has to be very finely machined, and then it has to be located very finely, and then you have to repeat that for so many rotors, and so on and so forth, plus, of course, the casing itself. So it's a very high-precision piece of technology. It's one of the reasons why, even through all the way through to World War II, the production of turbines and their gearing, eventually, um, were major bottlenecks in the production of ships. And so between it being somewhat easier to keep a hold of intellectual property and the fine tooling and precision engineering that you had to get exactly right, 
it just took several years for other companies to catch up. And in those days, several years could make all the difference between, you know, several generations of dreadnoughts with or without steam turbines. And bearing in mind, obviously, the turbine engine was, was debuted on smaller warships like destroyers and so forth a bit earlier, but scaling it up to the point where you could produce the power plant needed for running dreadnoughts was another matter. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the other nations weren't that that slow in picking up on it. I mean, they had the second German pre-dreadnought, oh, sorry, dreadnoughts, the Helgolands, had turbines, albeit, okay, they were a few years after Dreadnought. The Americans were also, relatively speaking, quick on getting turbines in. So you know, they both both navies had turbines in their Dreadnoughts before the close of the 1900s. But in that time, it, Britain, well, had built Dreadnought, the Bellerophons, the Temeraires, and were moving on uh, to their second-generation Dreadnoughts. And if the British government had been trying to penny-pinch in the middle of an arms race, they might have had considerably more dreadnoughts in the water than that. Connor Johnson asks, how cross-compatible were torpedoes? For example, if I took a working Mark 14 torpedo and gave it to a Fletcher-class destroyer, would it work? And what about if I gave, the, gave it a British Mark 9 or a Tribal a Mark 15? So they're not particularly cross-compatible. There's a number of issues. First, the diameter of the torpedo. Is it an 18-inch torpedo or a 21-inch torpedo? Because an 18-inch torpedo will quite happily fit inside a 21-inch torpedo tube launcher, bearing in mind the 18 inches is usually the diameter of an air launch torpedo. Um, but if you try and launch an 18 inch out of a 21 inch torpedo tube, there's going to be so much windage around it that it's not going to really go anywhere unless you've got a piston ram launcher. Then you've got the relative sizes. So on the screen you can see a Mark 13 and a Mark 14. And the Mark 15, which is the destroyer-based one, the Mark 13 is the airdrop, the Mark 14 is obviously the sub-launched, the Mark 15 is even larger than the Mark 14. So although the Mark 14 and the Mark 15 are both 21-inch torpedoes, you would find feeding a Mark 14 into a, say, a Fletcher's torpedo launcher tubes, you'd find it disappearing down into the depths of the, the launcher and not aligning properly, even if you know, the actual launch system might kick the thing out. And then finally, although within a certain family, so say Mark 14s and 15s, there might be some compatibility in terms of the settings um, and where you'd access to put those settings in, things for like the gyros and the depth keeping, etc. On different nationalities torpedoes, those particular ports along the side of the torpedo body and where you arm the fuse and so forth are going to be in different places. So, and, of course, they're going to weigh differently as well. So if you have a torpedo launcher capable of launching Mark 15 torpedoes and you take a British World War II era Mark 9 torpedo and stick that in instead, you could launch the thing, but you wouldn't be able to use any of the inbuilt tooling on the torpedo launcher to make the adjustments to, you know, gyro direction and depth switch even switching the thing on if you're using an electric torpedo that kind of thing you'd have to either manually do that um, if your torpedo launcher includes a hatch cover that you can lift up or you'd have to have a, a slightly different torpedo launcher so yeah the, they're not that cross compatible with the exception of if you're talking about um torpedoes of a specific family then you might have more luck so um, for example the mark 10 the pre predecessor to the mark 14 is a submarine launch torpedo for the u.s navy now the s-class can only use the mark 10s but as it turns out you can also get a mark 10 to work in a launch tube designed for a mark 14 and similarly various british torpedoes of families could work in the same launcher to a certain degree um, so, yeah, there's a bit of cross-compatibility, but not really across nations and not really across subsurface and airdrop domains. Edward Olson asks, In your recent video on US Navy fleet problems, you mentioned that the pre-dreadnought Iowa had been turned into a remote control ship, and in later problems other ships would also be remote controlled. 
I can imagine some servo like systems to steer her, but what about the engines? Do you just throw a bunch of coal in the boilers or open the oil valves, set the throttle to constant speed and hope that you sink her before the boilers run out of steam? So it depends which particular radio control target ship you refer to, because on some target ships, believe it or not, there were still people on board. Um, what they would do is they would massively over armor a small section of the citadel so that it was proof against pretty much anything and then you'd have a small crew aboard they would set the ship up ready for its target run and you know set the boiler pressures etc then they'd all retreat to this small well-guarded citadel and then people would pummel the ship in question then they pop back out again and um, make good any damage and whatever they needed to do that wasn't the case with the iowa in particular though uh, in her case the engines the well not the engines but the boilers were replaced with oil fired ones and then everything was actually fairly complexly rigged so you had uh, wireless receivers which could uh, change the course of the ship but the amount of oil that was fed into the boilers which obviously then affected the ship's speed was controlled by pumps which were also wirelessly controlled so you could actually throttle the ship up and down remotely with no one on board so the way they'd get Iowa would be a minimal crew would sail it to the target area they would obviously get the boilers all fired up um, get the ship on its general course and then once the oil sprayers were spraying and everything was happy and well then they would leave the ship it would obviously sail off into the target zone uh, with the appropriate controls being made for its direction and speed and people would start shooting at it and then if it was still around at the end you could reboard it the judge 2017 asks as you said in dry dock episode 185 some allied ships were still in the wrapping when the war ended case in point only 14 essex class actually saw service against the japanese was it ever considered to cut down Essex production runs even further, maybe down to 18 ships as compared to the completed 24, as the war outcome became clear? Would this have helped Midway finish earlier, or maybe Kentucky and Illinois get in the water sooner? I don't think it would have helped Kentucky or Illinois. Um, both of those ships' construction was paused, actually in large part, to consider whether or not to turn them into aircraft carriers. So... The only way that cutting down the Essex-class production run could have helped would have been if somebody had then suddenly panicked and gone, actually, I, I want that many aircraft carriers and the hull's halfway there, so it might be faster than starting from scratch. But the, the resources needed to complete Kentucky and Illinois are very, very different from the resources needed to complete any of the Essexes. So I don't think that would have helped there. Um, when it comes to the Midway... I think relatively unlikely because it seems to have taken on average around about a year and a quarter from keel laying to launch for an Essex class and then when you look at the Midway herself keel laying to launch was about a year and a half so three months additional work for a ship that is considerably larger and heavier than the Essex that's not exactly unreasonable there's there's not all that much that would suggest that that work could be accelerated by diverting resources or, or other materials from Essex class production lines. You might have shaved a few weeks off of it, perhaps, just by being able to flood the area with even more workers, but it's not exactly like they weren't working pretty hard to get rid of, to, well, to get, get rid of, to launch those hulls in the first place, get rid of them out of the slipway so they could put something else down there um and commissioning work you know they weren't exactly short of workers for that in particular so yeah I, unfortunately i don't think at the stage that the kentucky illinois and midway were at cancelling any essexes i don't think is going to actually help them it get built at all um really that the main things that the essexes would be absorbing that might accelerate other ship construction would be their long lead items their powertrains and so forth but for the midways the remaining iowas etc their powertrains were already ordered and in place there, there wasn't a shortage of those but if someone had tried to crash build something else new then maybe using essex materials might have helped there kainoa danford asks can you give a rundown of the marines invading korea in the 1800s <laughs> 
So, not exactly the US Navy's finest hour. Uh, this was in the late 19th century, back when the colonial policies of various imperial powers, you know, the strong will do what they will and the weak must suffer what they must, were very much in effect. And the 1871 expedition was basically twofold. Ostensibly, it was to look for the General Sherman, which was an armed American merchant ship that had tried to basically be a one-ship Commodore Perry fleet and much as Perry had kind of forced the Japanese to open up to trade, uh, the General Sherman decided it was going to force the Koreans to open up to trade, even if they, whether they liked it or not. Uh, didn't go too well for them. Everyone on board ended up being killed. And the Koreans kind of denied all knowledge of anything. So the ostensible expedition was to find out what happened to that, but it was also very much a mixture of punitive expedition and... You know, how dare you not trade with us, and etc. and so on. You know, how dare you uh, attack a ship that has attacked you because it's ours and only we're allowed to attack people. The kind of very, you know, 19th century imperial attitude that a lot of different um, Western nations shared. And then you also have, again, they wanted to get Korea to open up to trade. But unlike Commodore Perry's expedition, this one didn't wasn't attended by as much success the koreans basically sat there and said no we're not dealing with you um then you've got the us who was just like okay well then we'll bombard you we'll land uh, they did manage to win a, a small battle but although the battle was won and everyone was expecting you know we've proven our superiority they should give in now the koreans just showed up with even more better equipped soldiers and said nope still not negotiating with you go away um, and eventually it became fairly clear that no matter how superior weaponry and ships you might have there were an awful lot of people who were close enough in terms of equipment that you were probably going to get horribly overwhelmed and the americans therefore just left and Korea would stay in its state of isolation for quite a while until ironically enough um, somewhat later on the uh, Japanese you know the people that Commodore Perry had forced out of isolation showed up and uh, threatened the Koreans and basically said yeah you are now it's your turn to open up and the Koreans uh, at that point had to agree to open up not so much because of the relatively small Japanese expedition but more because of the fact that obviously Japan was quite close to Korea and the Koreans knew the Japanese did have a uh, history of coming after them whereas the USA at the time was just and well still is on the opposite side of the Pacific and at that period in the 1870s the Koreans weren't exactly too worried about the Americans showing up with massive invasion forces whereas yeah same can be said for the Japanese. BFW asks Command and control limitations. What are the limiting factors for the dreadnought through World War II period when it comes to deployed fleet size? Is there a point when there are simply too many ships total, or is it a ratio between the two opposing fleets? And are there examples of such situations of too many ships in an engagement? The main limiting factors when it comes to a deployed fleet size in 1910s through 1940s is actually, to be honest, in World War I, weather because everything's re fairly reliant on visual signaling so if the weather really closes in you've got to adopt a fairly tight formation but you can still come out a fair number of ships and see jutland um but you have to be able to relay signals to you know get everybody going in vaguely the correct <laughs> direction in at least when you're cruising in battle it's fairly obvious usually where the enemy is because you know the gunfire and the flashing and the explosions and everything but there really practically the limit to deployed fleet size was well how big a fleet have you got because well, there's several hundred ships at jutland well, over 200 ships are on one side and i think coming up close to that on the other and command and control it was entirely possible. Jellicoe deployed the Grand Fleet. That was you know, almost almost three dozen capital ships plus all the cruisers and destroyers and so forth. In World War Two, the limiting factor for deploying a fleet is is usually the fact that the fleets are smaller than they were in in World War One. Um, 
with a few exceptions right towards the end in the Pacific Theater, generally speaking, you physically didn't have as many ships as either the High Seas Fleet or the Grand Fleet could put into the area in a single formation. And obviously by World War II, you also had radio, fairly secure radio communications, which really helped with the nighttime and fog rain issues when it came to making sure your orders were received and acknowledged in good good time. Um, as far as too many ships total or you know too many ships in a particular engagement yes that could happen um but it was usually it, in those cases it was more a factor of people getting in the way of each other um so for example you could argue certain elements of the battle of Jutland actually had too many ships in an engagement or more accurately too many ships engaging in an engagement so the the death ride of the battle cruisers as it's like sometimes called by all rights then given the number and type of guns leveled at the german battle cruisers not a single one of them should have made it out the problem was that everybody thought this and so everybody in the grand fleet that could draw a bead on them was firing on them and there was no way to coordinate the gunfire <laughs> they hadn't put dye packets in the shells or anything at that point and so you had two factors working in favor of the germans one was apart from all the standard stuff that happens at Jutland, one was the fact there were so many shell splashes, it was almost a form of moving cover, which made it harder to figure out who you, you were supposed to be shooting at. And secondly, because so many people were shooting, and there was constant splashes of shells and so forth, it made it very difficult to work out which splashes were yours. So the individual battleships found it fairly difficult to correct for range a lot of the time. Whereas if there had been fewer you could have had as many ships as you like there but if there'd either been fewer ships engaging or some kind of divisional fixed fire arrangement the way that the russians did with their pre-dreadnoughts then you could have much more easily focused accurate fire on the german battle cruisers and then probably sunk them all hi bacon bomb asks was it true that uss laffey was opened up to the public after the kamikaze attack that she endured so that the public could view the damage done to the ship and if so, what was the public reaction to the damage? I don't know what exactly the public reaction was, but the point of opening up her to the public, and indeed she was, although obviously not in quite the state that she was in immediately after the kamikaze attack, she had to have some emergency repairs in the interim in order to, for her to just be able to get back to the continental United States, but nonetheless she was still in a fair, fairly worked over state. The idea was that the U.S. Navy and some elements of the U.S. government were worried that people in the, back in the U.S. might have thought that, well, it's towards the end. Well, obviously we know it's towards the end of the war. It was also fairly obviously it was kind of getting towards the end of the war. And uh, there was concern that the public and people working in the shipyards and so forth might have thought, oh, yeah, you know, the war's easing up. It's It's going to be fairly easy from now on. We can kick back a notch. And the display of Laffey in her very beaten up state was kind of intended to go actually um it's still quite serious out there please continue to work very hard andrew Waite asks i was reading about the loss of the destroyer hms rockingham in 1944 she strayed into a british minefield off the east coast of scotland set off a friendly mine and despite the efforts of the crew and several other vessels she would later sink what was the best way to extract yourself from a minefield should you be unfortunate enough to find yourself in one? So there were a number of possible procedures that different people would execute. Um, some, if you noticed the minefield and you were travelling at a cruising speed, would actually stop the ship and try and reverse out of it. Um, although this was a little bit dangerous because obviously you couldn't guarantee exactly how far into the minefield you'd gone, nor could you guarantee that you'd be retracing your steps exactly um or that the mines might not have shifted in the meantime um another way bear in mind you also have relatively speaking less control when you're reversing another way which for example the scrap iron flotilla in the mediterranean demonstrated when they found italian minefields was to get every available crewman on every available possible watching station so up on the rails up in the uh, crow's nest on the bridge uh, above the bridge basically any any pl platform that afforded you a decent view of somewhere and very carefully and gently maneuver forward at pretty much the uh, 
lowest speed that you could guarantee to have decent control over the ship. So usually something in the order of six to eight knots. And everyone would have orders. If you saw a mine, you had to call it out immediately so that the course corrections could be made. And in those circumstances, you would usually obviously try and initially avoid the mine that presumably you had spotted, but then circle back. So you would still be returning back roughly the way you came, but via a slightly different route and under a lot more control. And just hope that everybody had fairly sharp eyes and or the your opponent hadn't laid magnetic influence mines deep, in which case no amount of lookouts were really going to help. Bill Brockman asks, What did the French Navy do between September 1939 and June 1940? Did they catch any German commerce raiders or sink any U-boats, escort convoys or fight off of Norway? So the French Navy actually got up to quite a number of different things before the armistice and the rise of the Vichy government put all of that to a stop. There were French Navy or Marine Nationale escorts for convoys in the Atlantic. There was the Force de Rade, or Force, well, in English it's spelled Force de Raid, but I think Rade is how you pronounce it in French, apologies if that's wrong, um, which was made up of Dunkirk, Strasbourg, and a number of other fast French vessels, and that was deployed to help track down German surface raiders. So, you know, we have the Battle of the River Plate, but what sometimes goes up unstated in the operations of the Graf Spee was that you know, the Dunkirk and Strasbourg ships specifically designed to hunt and kill Graf Spee were in the middle of trying to track her down as well so one can only imagine the uh, rather one-sided fight that would have ensued had one of those ships or possibly both caught up with uh, the German commerce raider. They also lent a hand with uh, the Norway expedition uh, they escorted some ships in. Uh, they didn't have a m massive role in the Norwegian campaign, but there was definitely a French presence. Then you obviously have Dunkirk, French ships helping to evacuate from the beaches of Dunkirk. And you also had a French presence in the Mediterranean to try and keep an eye on the Italians and to help the British Mediterranean fleet deal with the Italian Navy once it became clear that, you know, the Italians had, were going to join the war, although obviously there was a very narrow window between Italy joining the war and France bowing out. That's how you had a bunch of French ships at Alexandria. Um, and towards the end, when it became clear that things were going rather badly for the French, you also had the uh, some French ships actually taking French gold reserves and so forth, over to Canada in order to continue the fight, which was actually, it, I mean, again, it's an interesting thing because you still, you all, you still in the Western world have this kind of narrative that the French don't really do much. And then, of course, you have the historical fact that the French didn't um, continue the fight. But as you can see, you don't take your national gold reserves over to a British held territory unless at least a good chunk of your government and navy is planning to fight on and up until a month or two before the armistice that was the commitment of of the french naval high command that they would fight on regardless and then it suddenly changed and backtracked and swiveled and went in four different directions at once mostly courtesy of admiral darlan and then you end up with the, the vichy government and part of that sudden collapse in in will from you know look we're, we're shifting ships out of france's operational area we're shifting our gold reserves away we're absolutely committed to fight which the british were entirely on board with and to be fair a lot of french sailors were on board with and then in the space of two to four weeks it com almost completely turned on its head which you know, under is one of the underlying reasons why you get mers el kabir because suddenly the the trust between british and french naval high command which had up until that point been incredibly high broke down very very quickly blacksmith panzer asks i recently picked up a copy of squadron signal publications u.s battleships in action detailing the service careers for various u.s standards and super dreadnoughts one of the photos in the book is of uss wyoming post her 1944 refit 
where the last of her 12-inch guns were removed and replaced with dual 5-inch 38s for anti-aircraft gunnery training purposes. And I have to ask, why? Had the war progressed to a point that the need for large-caliber naval gunnery training had faded, or was it simply that it could be done on other ships instead of needing one specific ship for it? Also, what kind of work was needed for this refit? I imagine all the existing hoists and carriages were already more than capable of handling much lighter shells, so were they simply modified to work with the new turrets, or were they completely gutted and replaced with in a more traditional manner? It was a mixture of things, primarily the fact that, you know, as you mentioned, other ships and installations were available for this kind of training work, and to be honest, by the latter part of World War II, teaching and training potential battleship gunners on how to man heavy guns by using World War One era 12-inch guns probably is not going to help them all that much if they're going to be manning 14 or 16-inch guns. So that element of training had moved away, and also it was you know, being somewhat reduced as well, even though there were a disturbingly large number of battleships in US Navy service at the time. Um, and with the kamikaze attacks obviously increasing the closer they got to Japan, and at that point the anticipated need to invade Japan with even more kamikaze attacks possible, it wasn't even so much the fact that you needed or wanted to scale back battleship gunnery training a little bit, it was more the fact that you needed to massively upscale anti-aircraft gunnery training, because anti-aircraft gunnery training was necessary on every single ship, whereas how to work heavy guns was only necessary on, relatively speaking, few ships. And so, on something the size of even an older battleship like Wyoming, you could accommodate an awful lot of people, and as you can see, you could put an awful lot of anti-aircraft guns of all sorts of different types, and thus you could ensure that you could train people in everything from uh, you know, single 3-inch, 20mm, 40mm, 5-inch, 38 singles, which would be useful for destroyer main and AA work, or if you're on Idaho, the secondary battery, and obviously the ubiquitous 5-inch, 38 twin mounting. In terms of the hoists and carriages and so forth, those would have been lifted out because you, you, the last thing you want is shells rattling around inside the hoists. And as you can see, there was more than enough space within 12-inch barbette to stick a 5-inch 38 mounting, and these mountings and their hoist systems were pretty standard by this point, so you could just lift out everything and pop the new ones in pretty much wholesale, because any crane that can lift out a 12-inch twin turret and its hoists can quite easily put in a 5-inch 38 mount and its hoists. The other advantage of using a battleship for this kind of training is, of course, if you're using a magazine that was designed to hold just over 100 rounds of 12-inch ammunition, you can hold an awful lot of 5-inch ammunition, which means, as a training vessel, you can do a lot of training. Andrew Waite asks, How does history rate Admiral James Somerville? He led the Royal Navy in many battles in World War II, including Mers el Kabir, uh, Spartivento, taking a part in the sinking of Bismarck, the defence of Malta, the Indian Ocean raid, care attacks on the Japanese and the Dutch East Indies. What were his qualities and why was he so active? Somerville's a slightly odd character when it comes to history judging him. Various historians have some very different opinions of him. Um, everything from you know being a very effective admiral to um, some people think he was never quite the same over after Mers el Kabir, which would be, would be understandable, I suppose. Um, but in general, I personally think he was actually a pretty good uh, admiral for the Royal Navy. He had a very aggressive streak, which was tempered somewhat by a, a degree of reasonable caution. Um, so he wasn't, you know, a, a Admiral Beatty style, I only have one setting and that's attack, 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 and you know, ignore everything else. Um, he did have, he had a very, again, a very, he's, he's a man of very fine balances. He had a very fine balance between what he saw as his duty and what he saw as his moral duty. He was incredibly reluctant to launch the Mers el Kabir attack, for example. He sort of basically did everything short of actual insubordination to try and avoid it, but when he was backed into a corner and told, no, this is these are your binary choices now, um, he went obviously went through with it. Um, albeit you could argue that he curtailed his bombardment considerably sooner than he could otherwise have done, um, which relatively speaking, minimise the damage to the French fleet. But then when you put him in that 
case of, you know, this is where you actually have to go and fight a quote unquote legitimate enemy. He showed, again, this balance of aggression coupled with actually, I would say, not a surprising, but for given pop history attitudes towards um, upper echelon admirals in early World War II. In that sense, a surprising realization of the need for combined arms. So, for example, at Spartivento, he led a British force against the Italian fleet, and he made sure to incorporate aircraft carrier strikes into his battle plan. So Ark Royal was launching carrier strikes whilst the fighting was going on. Now, bearing in mind, he had Ramillies and Renown up against Giulio Cesare and, and Vittorio Veneto, which meant that although technically both sides had two capital ships, um, he was outgunned in terms of cruisers. The Italians had bought all heavy cruisers. He had basically mostly light cruisers, bar barbaric. Um, and, yeah, well, with the best will in the world, Ramillies and Renown versus Cesare and Veneto. Okay, Cesare, yeah, is probably not a match for Ramillies, um, but Veneto is more than a match for Renown, um, in, in, at least on paper. The only difference being Renown can sh actually shoot straight. Um, but, um, yeah, so he, he didn't press his attack straight into the teeth of the Italian guns, which cause some people could, like Churchill to accuse him of cowardice. But, you know, he managed to get the Italians who notionally had the superior force to withdraw. But you then see later on in the other actions he takes part in, he is very conscious of how to use aircraft carriers. His main contribution to the sinking of Bismarck is, of course, managing uh, Ark Royal's strikes on Bismarck, although he doesn't take Renown in to help finish her off, even though technically he could have. Um, and then in the Indian Ocean raid, you see, again, he is kind of planning this joint battleship aircraft carrier strike against Nagumo's forces. Um, and, you know, there but for the, the grace of a, of a single turn in the late afternoon or one functioning radio goes a potential Midway or Coral Sea before Midway or Coral Sea. So, you know, he uh, I would say he's a... Given how most people generally tend to perceive him on a shallow level, he's a remarkably perceptive officer with a very good grasp of the naval version of combined arms tactics, with possibly the slight misfortune of, because he is relatively capable, he ends up being put on a lot of assignments on the peripheries where you really need someone who can organize and sort things out themselves as opposed to someone being right at the heart of things like Admiral Cunningham in the Mediterranean and then towards the end of the war um, he's promoted onwards and upwards where he ends up in the states where surprisingly enough um, or perhaps you know given the, the somewhat deeper analysis of Admiral King that we've done uh, on this channel unsurprisingly he actually gets on very well with Admiral King you know, obviously Admiral, Admiral King, famously anglophobic to varying degrees, but considering that Somerville was a competent and fairly balanced admiral, you then given that, you know, someone like a competent, fairly balanced admiral like, say, Jellico, who uh, King had gotten on with fairly well, it actually isn't too much of a surprise that Somerville also managed to get on fairly well with King, although it came as a surprise to everybody else. Modern Gamer asks, the battleship Tirpitz's greatest contribution to the war was being a, a threat that couldn't be ignored, i.e. a fleet in being. Admiral von Tirpitz could be considered the father of a fleet in being. Are there any other cases of a ship or person becoming the embodiment of an idea or doc doctrine? Well, whilst I'd quibble that uh, Tirpitz's idea of risk fleet strategy is a little bit different from the fleet in being idea, um... But, you know, close enough for government work, I suppose. Other ships and people that become embodiments of an idea or doctrine. Now, that's a relatively difficult one. Um, because ideas change quite rapidly. Um, and get adopted and enhanced by other people. And, of course, ships, to become the embodiment of an idea or doctrine, they have to be significantly long-lived. Um, and whatever it is that they're embodying usually has to also be still maintained by the Navy in question. So, I mean, you have the obvious ones, like HMS Victory it becomes for a once 
well, for a while in, immediately after the Trafalgar and then for a, a while longer once the people start appreciating her a bit more and refitting her in the early 20th century becomes kind of the embodiment of the idea of British sea power. Um, USS Constitution uh, for a good long while is the embodiment of the US Navy's spirit of, you know, I, I guess the, the 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 summation of the U.S. Navy's doctrine and spirit in most of the nineteenth century will be always outnumbered, never outgunned. Um, but I guess they they have to come up with something else for Constitution to embody for the U.S. Navy in the twentieth century because, um, well, out being outnumbered was not really a problem for the U.S. Navy um, from World War Two onwards. Mahan obviously becomes the embodiment of a unfortunately for him i guess slightly twisted i version of his doctrine um so mahan is kind of the go-to when people are like oh yes one big battle will win the war despite the fact that that's not actually what mahan said and of course for a while hood was considered the embodiment of british naval modern naval firepower um at least until she exploded Robert Olweiler asks, so given that as a bioengineer working in microfluidics I have to degas all of my reagents before I can use them, I'd imagine you'd also have to degas fuel, diesel, gasoline, fuel oil, etc., before using them to run the engines on capital ships. I use a vacuum chamber, but I imagine that given the scale, degassing tens of thousands of gallons of petroleum products, and come to think of it, the water for the boilers, with vacuum chambers would be rather impractical on board a warship. So how did they, especially early on, solve that problem? Did different nations use different techniques? And so did different kinds of fuels require different methods and standards? To be perfectly honest, I don't know. <laughs> However, I can make an educated guess based on some ancillary documentation that I discovered while researching the answer for this question. So what I found was... In the 1930s and 1940s, at least, there were a series of patents filed by various oil companies for degassing chambers and degassing machines, which seemed to work, uh, depending on the exact machine, either under vacuum pressure or just under sub-atmospheric pressure, um, where, and hopefully this will make some sense to, uh, the, the, to, to Robert, um, the, the, the patent describes a, one of the major patents actually describes a large cylinder through which freshly extracted crude oil would be fed, uh, sprayed through a number of nozzles into a sub-atmospheric uh, pressure chamber, where in theory the um, gasified uh, collections of, of material can be, it would be extracted. And then the oil obviously then extracted sands most of the gas products, etc. at the other end. Now, the prevalence of these patents from oil producing companies and within the patents, the description of these being operated either at refineries or from the sounds of it, possibly actually at the drilling sites themselves, makes me think that potentially the Navy, by the time it got its hand on hands on bunker fuel or aviation gasoline didn't have to worry about it because it would have already been degassed by the oil companies when they were extracting it in the first place at least to the level where it could work reasonably well in aircraft and ship engines now obviously if anyone has any experience in the oil industry and knows the history of it a bit more would like to to weigh in a bit please feel free to do so but that would be my supposition Xerxes asks, how were the fleets of the 18th century dash Napoleonic Royal Navy organised? Were there fixed squadrons and divisions with their own commanders, or were just single ships assigned to fleet commanders? Also, how did the red, blue, white ensign squadrons come into it? So red, white and blue squadrons had originally, back when the Royal Navy could be organised into a single large fleet, been the positions of... Uh, vanguard middle and rear guard squadrons but by the time of the 18th century in the napoleonic war um, the royal navy had grown far too large to assemble all of its ships of the line in one single massive doom fleet and the original positions of just admiral of the red admiral of the blue and admiral of the white had 
been stratified into vice, rear, and full admirals. Um, so there were there were nine um, possible positions, and they'd become more um, ranks of seniority going up the line um, from white to blue to red, if I recall correctly. So by the time period you're talking about, having a red, white, or blue ensign uh, for your admiral's flag was just more a matter of working out who was the more senior so you could have two admirals flying the same ensign and one being senior to the other so you could have an admiral of the white and a rear admiral of the white or you could technically have you know a vice admiral of the red and a rear admiral of the blue and those that they would then obviously sort out their seniority based on those as well and you have this slightly weird thing, therefore, of where a rear admiral of the red technically outranks a full admiral of the white, <laughs> at least in some parts of, of this time period. So that's basically just to work out who who's senior, who's second in command, and so on and so forth. But in terms of the fleets themselves, there are no fixed squadrons or divisions um, as an, on an ongoing basis. There are just ships that are available. So there would be various ships in various harbours, and when a particular purpose was called for, then they would look around and say, right, we need this many ships of th this kind, this rating or whatever, and uh, therefore we're going to bring these ships from here, these ships from here, these ships from here. We're going to put them all together, we're going to pick something relatively big and impressive for whoever we're sticking in command, and then they get that selection of ships and off they go. And if the officer in question is particularly influential, or they think very highly of them, they might give them a, something of a choice in selecting the, their ready ships, although not always. And then they'd be sent off on their mission, and the ships would rotate. So if you were in the Mediterranean fleet, you might be sent out to the Mediterranean with a dozen ships of the line, but some of those ships may be diverted to other missions later on. Some of them might have to return or be recalled, and new ships would be being sent out. So there would be this rotating system of vessels. Um, so you know, if you had, say, Admiral Jervis by the time of the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, obviously with Nelson there as well, if you look at his order of battle then, as opposed to his order of battle when he was originally sent out, they are actually very, very different. Some ships are still there, but a lot of them have changed. And if you're on say Bay of Biscay blockade duty again you would go out with a certain number of ships but those would again be rotated as damage and wear and tear took their toll and or possibly disease and new ships brought brought back through again commanders could also switch or divisional commanders could also switch again depending on their availability and their health so and even the flagships could change so you you might be as an admiral or, or the leader of whatever unit of ships you were given you might be given a particular ship you might already have command of or of a particular vessel but that might also change while you're out on station if you need to stay out on station but the ship that you're on has now become a bit decrepit well then you have to switch flags if a new much larger ship comes along you might depending on the kind of admiral you are and how big a difference it is you might have to or want to switch flag to a different vessel. So, for example, if you're commanding from you know a, sh a fleet of a dozen small third rates and the Admiralty sends you reinforcements which include a big second rate, you might feel compelled to now hoist your flag in the big second rate. So it's a very organic and evolving thing in the 18th century in the Napoleonic era there's there's not really an awful lot of anything that's fixed it's just kind of notional force levels more than anything else Joel Mullen asks what types and numbers of small arms would various types of Royal Navy ships battleships cruisers sloops etc carry in the Great War how many men and what arms would a boarding party normally carry and when inspecting a vessel when enforcing the blockade on Germany well, there is, of course, the standard Lee Enfield, um, but in terms of types, well, um, spoiler alert, that will come in <laughs> a video that I happened to film while I was in the United States um, earlier this year at some point further down the line. Um, 
so yeah types we'll see but let's just suffice to say they're incredibly varied but in very very broad terms anything bigger than a destroyer would usually be carrying at least one possibly more dismountable guns that could be used in the field if they were forming naval brigades um obviously that sort of colonial activity wasn't really done in world war one but these ships have been fitted prior to that so they had that capability um but most of the ship's equipment would consist of rifles and pistols as I say of varying types a battleship would carry typically several hundred of both um a cruiser about the same actually unless it's a small cruiser like a protected cruiser you, r roughly speaking you would expect there to be about two-thirds as many rifles and two-thirds as many pistols as there are people on the ship plus cutlasses officers swords um and towards the end of the great war maybe the occasional hand grenade in and you know if you're, you're doing a boarding party you would take a mixture of things rifle you take officers would obviously take pistols most of the boarding party would have rifles um, and almost everyone would have a sidearm of some description i.e a melee weapon that dropped off a little bit obviously <laughs> towards the second world war um, but in terms of inspecting a vessel while enforcing the blockade you'd usually have a boat uh, so rather than come alongside with you know ship to ship you would send a, an, an inspection boat out and then how exactly large the boarding party would be would vary depending on the size of the boat of the ship that you were boarding and whatever you happen to have available and to hand so you could send out you know a six man boarding party in a relatively small ship's boat you could send out a couple of dozen men in some of the larger ships boats um but it's a very much moving target you wouldn't really take anything heavier than a rifle because if you're boarding a merchant ship you don't really need anything heavier than that because if they do bring out anything significantly more dangerous well that's why you have an armed ship in the background with artillery to deal with it sir reginald lee the fourth asks as a naval historian which aspects of your research be they be they ships battles figures or broader topics most tend to make you tear your hair out and scream into throw pillows i'd say there's probably three main areas um one is otherwise pretty good historians who for whatever reason in their books suddenly diverge into broad generalities um i don't know whether they're tired at the time they're writing it or whatever um or just fed up um but usually when you make very very broad sweeping statements they're usually wrong <laughs> and it just makes me want to scream because i can be looking at a book going look 99 percent of this book is absolutely brilliant incredibly well researched very well backed up very well written and then you come across sort of a page or two and you're reading it and you're going this is so wrong this is so so wrong but because it's an easy quick sound bite you know you're going to have loads of people potentially later on picking up that short quote and firing it back as some kind of proof in discussions or debates and then going well you know so and so author very very good author very well respected therefore you know must be correct when he says this and you're just like it's going to be such an uphill struggle to explain why these generic generalized statements are wrong without making it sound like the person who wrote it is an idiot because they're not uh yeah it's just that that's kind of your head to desk moment uh, at least for one part another part is where you end up with battles actions designs etc where there's a multiplicity of sources which is good because then you can cross check things but then none of them agree because they all have very different points of view and so there is no consensus and then you're left there with a kind of stepford smiler grin going great what the heck am i supposed to make of all of this because you can literally you can have you know battles it's an easy one because they're 
much more confined than you know years and years of ship design but to use battles as an example you can have battles which were relatively speaking small scale so we're not talking about your midways and your jutlands you're talking about you know battles that maybe involve a dozen or so ships per side and you might have four naval observers on one side and a few officers who wrote their accounts as well and three or four naval observers on the other side and a few officers from that side who maybe wrote their accounts plus usually some newspaper report of some description so you've got maybe a dozen different versions mostly from people who were there and everything is different you know the formations are different the times of engagement are different who hit who and who took what damage is different who sometimes who won is different <laughs> and you're sitting there going well, you were all seeing the same thing. How could you possibly have got such diverging ideas about what actually happened? Um, <laughs> fortunately, that's not particularly common, but when it does come about, you kind of throw your hands up in the air and go, how can I possibly write anything about this? Because you know, there is no, no, no consensus. There's maybe some much, much later attempts to synergize things and coordinate with you know, post-battle shipyard records of what ships they were actually repairing and what kinds of damage was actually inflicted. Um, but those kinds of records tend to be a bit more patchy, a bit more difficult to get at, and a bit more incomplete. So even then, it, it might narrow down a dozen versions to three or four likely versions, but you're still left with three or four versions, none of which you can particularly prove or disprove. And um, without getting into details of running into people who occasionally make you want to just scream into a pillow um, through this sheer stupidity. Um, I think the the third one would be filing systems. Um, because sometimes when you're looking in the US National Archives or the Q Archives or the Portsmouth Archives, sometimes, in fact, to be fair, a lot of the time, you will be quite merrily, you know, searching away and go okay i want to know about this so you type in the relevant keywords and results come up and you're like oh great i can either view them online or i can physically go and book a viewing to view the documents and it is all as you expect and this is when you are happy and then sometimes you search for something and you know the records are in the archive there somewhere but no results come up and you think that's not right that's not right at all. What's going on here? And usually what happens is either the thing exists, but it's under some extremely specific keywording or or terminology or title that would not immediately make the most sense. Um, although, or might not be so obvious. Although some, sometimes it's not it's not that difficult. For example, looking up free, uh, free, fleet problems. Uh, the archives for fleet problems there's plenty of written documentation in the u.s national archives about the various fleet problems but if you're trying to look up pictures or video and you search fleet problem you will find almost nothing but you have to do things like u.s navy exercise or fleet exercise or fleet deployment or fleet drill something like that and those will bring up results which are of the fleet problems and sometimes even the little you know title page on on the film as it's running, we'll say fleet problem, you know, 13 or something. And you're like, okay, well, it very blatantly is a fleet problem. It's titled as a fleet problem within the film itself or on the picture. It's written fleet problem nine. So why the heck is whoever decided to archive it calling it something different? Um, and then you get stuff that's completely misfiled, which is just... You know, it doesn't show up at all. You know the document exists because you've seen references to it elsewhere. But you, you cannot for the life of you find it and you have no idea where it is. That can be incredibly frustrating, especially when what the document you're looking for is a key piece of the total the total evidence. Um, although the flip side to that is you do sometimes get very surprising discoveries uh, when you're rooting through archive boxes because you know as for an example for, for myself when i've been in the queue archives i was quite merrily paging through reams and reams and reams of documentation on the eastern fleet circa 1942 for doing research for operation c opened up a box and 
included in that box were a bunch of notebooks and I thought oh maybe these are some kind of uh, deck log or something submitted by one of the crew open them up and they were actually um hydrodynamic test records from 1919 for the battle cruiser 1919 design and a bunch of other uh, preliminary tests for various warship classes that the royal navy was either building or considering building in 1919 one or two of which were recognizable and the rest of which had never seen the light of day and a number of which I'd never even heard about because they'd been so preliminary. And I was looking at it going, wow, this is really, really interesting. If someone was looking to research, you know, what kind of warships were the British planning to build in 1918 through 1920 before the tranche that would become uh, eventually the ones that the Washington Treaty put the kibosh on, um, what, so what's their immediate predecessors? You'd be thinking, oh, great, this is absolutely vital, wonderful information. Um... And nobody's ever going to find those documents if they were searching for that kind of information. They'd only come across those documents if they were searching for what was HMS Warspite doing in the Indian Ocean in 1942, which is completely unrelated. Because at some point, maybe right back at the start, somebody had misfiled them um, for whatever reason. Phil Crider asks, Would you discuss the Wrens? I've just finished Neville Shute's Requiem for a Wren. It re recounts some of the valiant service by women in World War II. I'd love to hear more. It is something that probably needs its own video at some point, but in brief, the Wrens, or W-R-N-S, the E is kind of superfluous, but was added for um, everybody to have an easy-to-pronounce acronym, basically Women's Royal Naval Service, was actually believe it or not, an artifact of World War One, very briefly um, in the last couple of years, but almost disbanded almost immediately at the end of World War One. then, as you said, reformed in World War Two, And they went on to take on a huge number of roles. Now, when you look at the way they were initially used, you might think, oh, yeah, sounds like the early 20th century, all right. Um, then being put in, like, cooking roles, clerks roles, secretary roles, etc. Then people began well at least some officers began to figure out that some of these women were pretty sharp and uh suddenly you found them manning significant portions of places like bletchley park deciphering german enigma and other coded transmissions uh, of course although they're mostly not wrens um parallel services uh, it existed in the army and the RAF, so you quite often see them acting as fighter controllers during the Battle of Britain. Obviously, mostly they are not Wrens, although there were one or two Wrens there as well, because the Fleet Aeron was involved in the Battle of Britain as well. Um, but within the realms of the, the Fleet Air Arm, uh, sorry, the, the Royal Navy, they weren't allowed to serve in active combat roles, uh, something which would continue significantly after the Second World War, but back at home and occasionally at sea in certain specific on certain specific ships that weren't classed as frontline combat ships they filled a huge number of specialist functions including as i mentioned in my videos on western approaches command they formed watu the western approaches tactical unit which was basically the thinking house behind beating nazi u-boat tactics and then passing on those tactics to the people at the front line who would then go and you know, blow up a bunch of U-boats. And considering that they were able to outthink you know, long-service submarine officers, and obviously that then translated to outthinking and destroying numerous German and other Axis submarines, they were pretty darn good at their job. <laughs> yeah, it turns out that if excluding half of the human population from your ability to outthink your opponent is not necessarily a good thing. And when you bring them in, yeah, um, if anyone has met a Wren veteran from World War II, uh, especially those who served in somewhere like Western Approaches Command or Bletchley Park or whatever, they're usually still frighteningly intelligent <laughs> Um, even these days, you know, when they're in their 80s, 90s, or mostly 90s, or even over 100. Um, so yeah, definitely something I need to make a Wednesday video of at some point. And if you want to know more specifically about the stuff that they did with regards to the Battle of the Atlantic, that's the reason this little flyer's been up here during this question, um, there is the Wrens Museum, which opened in April this year, uh, down at Western Approaches Command in Liverpool in the UK. So I would highly encourage you to go and have a look there if you want to look into the subject further. Andronor asks, when the Allies occupied Iceland, what significance did it have in the Battle of the Atlantic? The occupation of Iceland had a 
fair number of significant positive effects in the Battle of the Atlantic. Uh, for one thing, the now occupied harbours provided a rest, re fuel and resupply base for escorts. So this allowed both a rationalisation of escorts and also for the escorts to operate in a more proactive manner because obviously you could have off the coasts relatively short-range escorts like sub chasers and such at the US and UK coasts but they didn't have the range to go out into the mid-Atlantic but equally if you had your bigger mid-Atlantic escorts like destroyer escorts, frigates, corvettes going end to end um, then you'd have very over um, protected convoys right up at the coasts and you'd be putting wear and tear on ships that maybe aren't quite as good at operating in littoral waters. And so Iceland, amongst other places, was kind of not just a rest, resupply and refuel base, but also a handover point and an operational base for various escorts. So it would mean that rather than... It would mean, so for example, a convoy could leave, um, given its position, more likely the UK, and then escorts which might have been bringing a convoy across from America could break off, hand over to escorts that had sailed out either from Iceland or from Britain. They could hand over the convoy, head to Iceland, refuel, resupply, and then come back out again, grab a convoy that was coming from the UK back to the US off of its coastal in and initial escorts and keep going. So it helped to help the ocean escorts generally plus of course if you were you know part of what some of the later hunting groups you could come back re-ammunition and refuel in an area that's closer to your operational area than either the US or the UK coastline when you're hunting U-boats in the mid-Atlantic um, it also meant that if ships were damaged they had somewhere to divert to that was closer than either side of the Atlantic, which saved a few ships. Um, and of course, by being able to refuel closer to the convoy routes, it also meant that escorts could afford to be, as I said earlier, be more proactive in hunting the U-boats. Because if you have, let's say, a an escort that can keep up with the convoy, uh, which is pretty much any of them, but it can keep up with the convoy, it has a slightly higher turn of speed, so we're talking about destroyer escorts or frigates, but maybe in if you include the time chasing your boat thing and the time catching up with a convoy in and of its own fuel load using an arbitrary figure it can do that six times and still go transatlantic so that means it can chase six u-boats or six contacts and then after that it's going to be restricted to you know sticking close to the convoy Otherwise, it might run out of fuel if it goes off uh, chasing you at high speed again. Whereas with Iceland present, if you've got a, a ready reserve of convoy escorts there, it means that if you have a wolf pack attack developing, say, a third of the way between the US and the UK, your destroyer escorts and frigates can be very proactive. They can charge down you know, 12 two dozen contacts if necessary and sure they might no longer have the fuel to reach all the way to the UK but that doesn't matter because they can hunt plenty of U-boats and then they can signal ahead and go right look we need refueling um, and while we're away refueling the convoy is going to need more protection so then Iceland can dispatch a few more escorts they can take over protection of the convoy um, for the rest of the run back to the UK when, when the convoy comes past and then those escorts can drop in at Iceland, resupply their depth charges, refuel their ships, and then, similar to before, they can catch a convoy, either catch a convoy that's coming back from the UK to the US, or they can do the same thing that the escorts that were just at Iceland did for them for another convoy that might have been heavily attacked. And that's not even counting the fact that, obviously, it Iceland can act as a mid-Atlantic airbase, and did act as an airbase, for long-range patrol aircraft, thus increasing the coverage of Allied patrol aircraft in the Atlantic and for areas where they could already cover, increasing the duration of the aircraft's patrol capabilities because they could get to their patrol areas with, um, after travelling a shorter route. Dave Collier asks, Can you tell us a bit about the Great Storm of 1703, especially with the effect it had on European naval forces given the ongoing War of Spanish Succession? 
So the Great Storm was a prolonged, basically a prolonged hurricane that hit mostly England and parts of Ireland and northern France in 1703, as the name suggests, and caused quite a bit of destruction. Um, a lot of it on land, but also a fair number of Royal Navy warships, including uh, quite a number of rated line of battle vessels, were sunk and others found themselves in very weird circumstances i mean one that was quite happily moored off the southeast english coast um to its credit the crew managed to keep it afloat but by the time the winds died uh, they fa they found that you know sailing blindly in an effort to keep themselves from being sunk they'd somehow wound up um, off the coast of sweden of all places and had to uh, rather sheepishly make their way back across the entirety of the north sea to where they'd started um and you know as the area of effect suggests most of it affected the royal navy uh, the french navy at the time was either elsewhere or in port because the british were doing their level best to keep the french navy bottled up so warship losses were mostly concentrated amongst the royal navy it didn't have a huge overall effect on the British war effort in the uh, War of Spanish Succession. I mean, they hadn't been doing particularly well in the opening phases anyway in general military terms, but 1704 was the capture of Gibraltar, so it clearly didn't impede the Royal Navy to the extent they couldn't conduct offensive operations. But with an entire squadron's worth of ships of the line going to the bottom, it did mean that the remaining ships were stretched a lot further and of course building efforts for new ships had to be accelerated which as I say, it wouldn't have overall limited Royal Navy operations but it did mean that the Royal Navy operations that were undertaken with the remaining ships would have been a lot more stretched um, additional operations that may otherwise have been undertaken in the mid 1700s either period 1700 to 1710 W wouldn't have been undertaken because there wouldn't have been the ships available um, and other ships would have had to be retired because they were sailed to within an inch of their lives covering you know place slots that other ships would otherwise have done and of course um, the loss of skilled sailors would also have been quite a quite a blow so it was something that the Royal Navy had to recover from but by the overall arc of the War of Spanish Succession apart from putting an addi additional logistical strain on the British contribution to the war effort, it doesn't appear to have had, um, at least for in terms of purely naval efforts, a significant curtailment effect. Uh, the, the story about what happened on land in the UK is a completely different matter, but that's outside the scope of the channel. Duke of Petchington asks, what changes pre-World War II would improve the fighting capability of the Italian Navy? Uh, it really depends how many butterflies you want to step on. I mean, for any Navy going into World War II, looking back with the benefit of hindsight, you can turn around and go, yes, well, they should have done this, 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 and this. You know, US Navy, British Navy, Kriegsmarine, Imperial Japanese Navy, and, of course, the Russian Marine. All of them have laundry lists of things that could be done to improve their performance. But most of them involve colossal hindsight <laughs> and uh, therefore in terms of what you could realistically do pre-world war ii are you know not practical but if i was going to pick a top three things that you know there but for the grace of god go i could have been changed and might have radically improved the uh, italian chances well not to necessarily chance of victory, but it radically improved their overall performance in World War II. I would go for three things. One is that they basically stopped development of their own radar. Obviously, that turned out to be a bit of a mistake. Um, so if they had continued the development of their radar without interruption and then had at least some form of serviceable radar by 1941, that certainly would have helped. Um, depending on exactly what the development path of that would have taken and which ships they would have been fitted on, it may or may not have avoided Matapan, or it may have made Matapan a lot more of a an even fight. Not that you know, three heavy cruisers versus a trio of battleships is ever going to be an even fight, but hey, at least they've got torpedoes. Um, anyway, so that would be one thing. 
Another thing would be if they did more extensive gunnery trials with the Litorios and thus caught the fact that perhaps the accuracy was not as good as it should have been on the guns. And so that would then hopefully allow them to start working on something that might address that, which obviously, given some of the engagements the Litorios found themselves in, if they'd had more accurate guns, that could have significantly improved their performance if they started hitting the things they were aiming at. And then finally, perhaps a fairly mundane thing, but given how much the Italian Navy was constrained during the latter parts of its engagement in the war by a lack of fuel oil, um, massively stockpiling fuel oil would be the other thing. Now, the problem you have there is that, uh, well, put very basically, Large-scale naval operations in World War II consume colossal quantities of oil. So, to a certain degree, pre-war banking of oil reserves would help. But when you compare even the fuel capacity of some of the underground oil facilities that the British had in Scotland and Scapa, uh, or the Americans had in Pearl Harbor... Even facilities that huge needed constant refilling from tankers. So they acted as, you know, deep reserves which you could draw on to keep many, many ships fueled. But continued operation of substantial numbers of ships would drain even those pretty darn quickly. So you needed this this constant um, refueling effort of the tankers to, and the and so forth to keep going. Now, the fundamental problem with the Italians was that they really had most of their access to fuel oil cut off by the war, or severely curtailed. And so even if they tripled or quadrupled the size of their oil fuel reserve farms, that would allow them enough fuel for maybe a half dozen extra operations if nothing else was done about the fact that you know they they can't ref refill those easily so it would have improved their performance a little bit because they would have had a bit more choice about you know when and where they can deploy their forces rather than having to curtail some operations or make some operations smaller because of lack of fuel oil but it would have to go hand in hand with also trying to I mean, you'd, you'd either either have to try and come up with some way of getting more fuel to Italy um, under the assumptions of wartime conditions, or you would have to go stupidly unrealistic with, uh, you know, how much fuel you were storing um, on, a, on a truly basic, well, for, the, for lack of a better term, truly Romanesque scale of storage, which I suppose you could do um, if you really, really wanted to. Pedden Harley asks... In 1850, a 9,500 weight 68 pounder was mounted in a carriage that would have been understandable to Nelson and possibly even to Drake. After firing and reloading, it was run out with muscles pulling ropes through blocks and tackles and aimed by muscles using hand spikes for leverage. Recoil was absorbed through friction of the carriage sliding back on the deck and the heavy ropes around the breech. Around 1900, a 12 inch Mark 9 gun weighing 10 times the 68 pounder and firing a shell more than 10 times as heavy, was able to be fired more rapidly and far more accurately than the 68-pounder. I understand something of the changes in gun design and construction, but very little of the changes in gun mountings. How were the tasks of running out, aiming, and absorbing recoil, which involved muscle ropes, levers, and friction in 1850, accomplished in 1900? And could you briefly describe the major developments in gun mountings between 1850 and 1900? Well, gun mountings in that period are, again, pretty much a video unto themselves. But very briefly, it had near enough, apart from pushing a few levers and buttons and maybe the odd uh, crank, gone completely away from muscles to mechanical systems by the 1900s. And for the very good reason that no realistic amount of muscle was going to easily move some of these much larger weapons. Now, it, it went on by leaps and bounds. So by the 1900s, unless you're the French, because they managed to get electrical 
motor driven systems working pretty uh, much earlier than anybody else um, but for, for everybody else stuck slightly one technological step behind they were using hydraulics and then later a mixture of electronics electrical and hydraulic systems would come in in the 20th century but yeah, it was hydraulic systems by the 1900s for the most part um, with fine adjustments done by heavy gearing um, and also backup systems done by heavy gearing. Uh, the main thing that allowed all of that was, of course, the fact that the, car the gun carriage had become metal rather than wood, and thus could, um, because it was a lot more rigid, it could have things like gearing without the, the gears slipping and jumping out all the time. But be between going from wood to metal and then eventually end up with metal, hyd mostly hydraulically driven stuff, you went through a period of steam power operation. And then steam-driven hydraulic motors, then electrically driven hydraulic motors, then direct electric drive, and so on and so forth. But that, that's the very brief uh, way of going about things. But the thing with the, the steam-driven systems was that obviously you could use the power provided by your boilers. So a ship is obviously having already already been hopefully underway, will be able to provide that power. The restriction of course being that every bit of steam that you take away from the boilers is less steam that can be used in the engine so in some ways almost like a, a star trek power management system if everything on your ship runs on steam um, then the total power output of your boilers is not the total power output that you can put into your screws and uh, therefore, by not using some of those other systems, you can improve your ship's speed. This was actually demonstrated by the Carpathia when it was rescuing the Titanic. It literally did a divert all power to the main engines by shutting down everything else on the ship that used steam power, which allowed it to pump more steam into the, into the engines, which allowed it to go a bit faster. Anyway, that aside, um, one, of the, one of the problems with steam power in the gun mountings and turntables and so forth is of course that you expend the energy that is in the steam so you can do a certain amount and then you have to get more steam in um, and if you, you can't have a continuous steam input into the system because otherwise you'd have to put <laughs> you'd either have to have a complete closed loop steam cooling and recycling system the same way or water cooling and recycling system the same way you have in the engines in the turrets which would make things even more bulky and heavy um, or you'd have to have some kind of outlet for the steam you imagine imagine little turrets with little funnels or something um, so you you could run out of steam pressure and then have to recharge it now that because of the slow rate of fire during most of the latter part of the 19th century that wasn't too much of a concern but in a prolonged engagement that might happen um, and of course it, it's steam it's high pressure high temperature fairly vulnerable to damage and very complex so first taking that steam to run hydraulic systems which could then transmit their energy up into the turrets and the guns etc was much more preferred because apart from anything it meant those steam systems could be themselves lower down in the ship which meant you could incorporate them into the closed loop systems that were the boiler and engine configurations and whilst having a high pressure hydraulic line pop on you is as anyone who's ever had to work with those things not exactly a pleasant experience um it is a slightly more pleasant experience than having a high pressure steam line pop on you because a hydraulic line at least won't scald you or boil you to death uh, it's got a variety of other interesting ways of killing you but the steam line could have done that as well and as kind of intimated earlier there was a quite a complex system of gears and also counterweights in order to help uh, absorb recoil balance the guns etc etc and you'd be surprised just how much you can do with a decent counterweight system and proper hinging bearing in mind that you know you look at something like the doors of norad as a uh, semi-occasionally featured in the wonderful hit shows stargate sg1 or the doors to quite a number of other bunker facilities they may weigh tons or tens of tons but a properly balanced door that might weigh 50 tons can actually be opened and closed by a single person and similarly a gun that might weigh 90 100 tons on a carriage and turntable that might weigh even more if correctly provided with the proper gearing and counterweight systems could if all the other systems go down 
be elevated and trained by a couple of men with some handles turning the gears. So it's a hugely advanced piece of technology, but it's something that are, that changes not quite on a yearly basis, but probably on a, a two or three yearly basis. So some of the initial guns that get quite large, part of their slow rate of fire is the fact that those systems haven't advanced too much further beyond the, the wooden carriage. But as guns get bigger, the necessity of metal carriages gets more and more, and you know necessity breeds invention. Peter Guy asks, We're all familiar with the use of red lighting for internal illumination on modern warships at night. During the Age of Sail, what was the practice of, for lighting aboard a ship while at sea? I can't imagine they had any lanterns at all on deck for risk of being seen and conversely not being able to see very far due to the lantern glare, but perhaps they were allowed deep within the ship? So they would actually have a number of lanterns hung, believe it or not, in the Age of Sail. Um, the whole, you know, red and green lights, that has its origin way back in the Age of Sail as a way of both being able to see a ship coming and also working out which direction it was pointing. Um, they would also have an addi additional lanterns high up in the masts because that allowed, that gave you a bit more of a point of ref 3D point of reference. And then if you were sailing in formation, there would be agreed patterns or colours of lights um, or sizes of lanterns sometimes in the masts and also as, um, on the stern. So if you see um, some uh, period artwork of Age of Sail ships from the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, you'll sometimes notice absolutely massive lanterns on some of the bigger ships mounted on the stern. And that's to help signal everybody else um, at night. So yeah, there, there'd be a number of large lanterns on the ship. Um, night vision, obviously, if you were on the lookout high up in the foremast or something like that, you'd be far enough away and not looking at the lanterns at the, in the stern part of the ship that your night vision shouldn't be too badly affected. Um, they're not going to deck out the entire ship with lanterns unless, well, apart from anything, there's limited lantern fuel oil, but and a merchant ship might just for, for ease of use, but generally warships would run the necessary lights for navigation, um, unless, of course, they're trying to act in stealth mode, in which case they can extinguish them and run the risks. And, of course, you could have some deeper in the ship to make sure people don't trip over and fall down hatches and so forth. But to be honest, if there's any kind of significant light, even if it's moonlight or reflected light off of clouds or whatever, then... You know, if a ship is sailing with any substantial amount of sails, it's going to be somewhat visible no matter what, um, unless they're being very careful or it's a very, very dark night. So, yeah, normally ships would have lanterns out, but not too many of them. If they wanted to act in a very uh, stealthy manner, then they could douse those lanterns and sneak about with the attendant risks. But there normally wasn't any significant concern about specifically night vision style things the way that you'd have in the 20th century. Jack Devaney asks, Just curious, you've mentioned the roaring trade between ships of the Royal and American navies of ice cream and alcohol in the past, and I was just curious about the details of such inter-navy bartering. How was it looked upon by officers, and what kind of other items were traded throughout history? How regular was this commerce? And finally, in your re years of reading memoirs and accounts of day-to-day -day life, what was the strangest or most amusing item traded? So the details of these various trades between navies, assuming that obviously it's a relatively friendly thing, largely depends on two factors. One, the personality of the officers involved, and two, how legal the items being traded are in the respective navies. Now, in the latter case, in the section you mentioned in World War II, the Royal Navy had a huge advantage because there was nothing in the regulations that said you couldn't have ice cream on a US on a Royal Navy ship. And obviously the US Navy was providing it to their own ships. So if you happen to have a bunch of ice cream on a Royal Navy ship, pretty much the only questions that will be asked is, where did you get that? What did it cost? And can I have some? <laughs> or you're going to let me have some, aren't you, sailor, uh, if you were an officer? Whereas, obviously, alcohol was, technically speaking, forbidden on US Navy warships. So if you were found with a large consignment of Royal Navy rum on board... Unless your officer was being very liberal, then you might have some fairly awkward questions to ask. 
Um, so, yeah, th th there's a little bit of an inequality of trade there. But as I said, it also depends on the officers because some officers might be like, oh, no, well, this is not standard issue regulations, uh, food materials. Therefore, you know, that that even if they wouldn't take it away necessarily because no one separates a sailor from his food at peril of their own life but um then they might assign punishment duty whereas most officers as long as it's fairly in uh, innocuous would be fairly uh, look the other way about it uh, or, or take part and other officers may well facilitate such things so um you know it because the other thing is some of these trades could be conducted man to man if especially not so much with resupply at sea that has to be a little bit more formally organized but if you're in port you know if you meet up with a let again using the u.s and royal navies as an example if you meet up in port in darwin in australia you can be like oh yeah well you've got a bunch of ice cream how about we'll bring a bottle of rum tomorrow to this bar and you bring two cans of ice cream and we'll trade that so that's a personal trade affects a few people um but if the officers are a little bit more of the of this type that really want to get in on this kind of action then they might have full-on negotiations either between the ships but directly between the officers or perhaps facilitated if they don't want to make it official on on the books trades they might do it unofficially but via the sailors so you might have a you know a, a, let's say a sailor who's well known at being able to easily acquire things and as you know, he's merrily heading down the deck of uh, hms anson say one of the ship's senior officers might pull him aside and, you know jenkins obviously you aren't going to do anything untoward and obviously you would never participate in any kind of illegal trades or anything no sir uh, absolutely not sir and you wouldn't hazard ship's resources for your own personal benefit no sir absolutely not sir very good right well um if at any point during your escapades ashore you happen to run into um a, a seaman of similar disreputableness to yourself i don't know what you possibly mean so no of course neither do i um then well we do happen to have a a slight overstockage of uh rum and uh, two fairly nice bottles of whiskey which um, may be tragically unguarded on the uh, on the fan tail at some point later this evening and if they should disappear there would of course have to be a very detailed investigation but if they were replaced with like goods, um, say, for example, two large crates of ice cream and a couple of bottles of maple syrup that they, I believe, acquired somehow off of the Canadians. And if, uh, let's say, 10% of that was set aside for the officer's mess, then I don't believe there would be any problem. Speaking entirely hypothetically, of course. Yes, sir, of course, sir. hypothetically, sir. Very well, carry on, Jenkins. And then, mysteriously, a large-scale trade may or may not, obviously, have happened. <laughs> and then sometimes people just dropped all pretense and would signal, you know, Oi, you lot, we've got this, you've got that. Do you want to trade? Yep, great. Send it over, and you get full resupply trades at sea. It scales all the way, and some of the stuff is, is quite amusing. Um so yeah it, there, there is no one single answer as to how it was viewed and how it was looked upon by officers because it very much depended on the officers and the ship in question um but in terms of one of the most amusing sets of items traded apart from obviously the menagerie that was bought aboard the second pacific fleet whilst it's not a single item i think the thing i laughed the most about was the account of one sailor in the british pacific fleet who fetched up alongside some american counterparts at some atoll or island or resupply base or something in the western pacific and he recounted how obviously he had spent most of the war in the mediterranean fleet but on uh, when they were granted liberty or, or shore leave um ashore or on resupply ships there immediately sprang up an incredibly complex and intricate market and this particular uh, sailor actually went into finance after the war and he said there was no market as complex in his later post-war financial dealings as the one that sprang up on that pacific island that day as 
several thousand men of the British Pacific Fleet and the US Navy's Fast Carrier Task Force began to calculate the various exchange ratios of wartime souvenirs. You know, so this is an ostensibly Japanese battle flag, but this is ostensibly the wings of a, uh, as in the the badge insignia, of a Luftwaffe pilot. Um, So, you know, how how many Luftwaffe pilot officers' wings are worth a Japanese battle flag versus how many fragments of a Zero are worth so many fragments of a Stuka and are Stuka fragments more or less valuable than fragments of a BF-109 or an SM-79? And, you know, the, the, the rash, a, a German Africa Corps field ration book that was traded with the Desert Rats in Alexandria, how much is that worth versus the, you know, a, a, a personal effects tin of a Japanese soldier from Guadalcanal that had been traded with the US Marines three years ago? Because, of course, there's all sorts of weird and wonderful bits of memorabilia. Shrapnel, of course, not only being traded in British playgrounds, but also aboard ships. You know, this is, well, you know, this is genuine shrapnel from um, Operation Pedestal. Well, I have genuine shrapnel from the uh, night action of Guadalcanal. Well, to have, you know, this this is a big chunk. This is four inches long and this is two inches long. But this one's sharp. You can cut open boxes with it. And so on and so forth. And you know, considering that almost nothing is, has a direct equivalent or a significant supply, the absolutely intricate web. He goes on for about three pages discussing all the various exchanges that were made and how people bargained and argued their way down to what they thought was a good deal, um, relieving themselves of various bits and pieces of wartime memorabilia they'd collected and gathering new stuff. Burnt Potato asks, what, in your opinion, would be the most successful lopsided ships with excessive speed, protection, or firepower, respectively? Okay, well, in terms of firepower, I think the award has to go to the 20th century monitors, because, well, the big gun ones anyway, because you talk about ships with 12, 14, and 15-inch guns, and the occasional 18-inch gun, occasionally one or two of them were lost, but by and large they tended to have a fairly high survivability rate and they tended to execute their missions fairly well and they were usually missions that no one else could do. Um, So in terms of both accomplishing the missions they're designed for and not losing vast numbers of themselves, the monitors are definitely the most lopsided firepower-wise vessels considering they mount battleship-scale armament on hulls that don't weigh as much as a typical cruiser sometimes occasionally not even as much as a particularly ambitious destroyer and manage to get away with it ships with lopsided armor values on the other hand are much more difficult to go for because usually the creation of a ship with an incredibly high armor value leads to people very rapidly developing very large guns to deal with it and hence various races um And once you get into the 20th century, armour values are, for the most part, relative, and armour weighs so much that if you put a significant chunk of armour on something, it can actually completely rule out putting in something else that's almost equally as vital, like, you know, a decent speed or enough firepower for it to make a difference. Because you have to get into truly stupid numbers in order to make your ship completely proof against incoming shells in the 20th century you you can make yourself theoretically immune at a typical battle range but a very very heavily armored ship is usually a somewhat slower and that doesn't stop your opponent therefore from closing the range and just blasting you at point blank where your armor's not gonna stop their shells so i'd say in relative terms for protection I'd probably go for something like HMS Warrior. In fact, HMS Warrior specifically. One, she's still around, and two, she was, she was of, she was a ship, which is almost not quite, but almost unique, in as much as when she was launched, she was basically invulnerable to anything that could be thrown at her. Um, at very, very close range, a steel shot with the latest powder fired from a sixty-eight pounder could maybe just about get through her armor. But practically speaking, on the high seas, nothing was going to smash through. Um, it would, and I mean, okay, it didn't last too long. Within three or four years, uh, guns had been developed that could just about get through her armor. Uh, 
um, at point blank range and then later at sl slightly longer ranges. Um, you have obviously the eternal online arguments about whether or not an 11 inch Dahlgren could or couldn't get through Warrior's armor. Um, spoiler alert, at the time that she was launched, at the time of the Battle of Hampton Roads, the answer is no. By the end of the American Civil War, once the 11 inch has been uprated and uprated and uprated to its late war charge levels, not full charge, because they're all full charges, because the US Navy issued full charges, but once Dahlgren has authorized larger, effectively supercharges for his guns, and the US Navy in the late Civil War and immediate post-Civil War environment has managed to get their hands on developing steel shot, then the 11-inch gun is capable of dealing with warrior at closer ranges. Slight side issue, a side argument there, but anyway. So, yeah, warrior at the time of her launch was very heavily weighted towards protection, and, well, apart from in, in a large way, along with Gloire, inspiring the entire ironclad era, she is also still around today, so that's fairly successful. And in terms of excessive speed most successful that's a very difficult one actually because you could argue that the lexingtons had excessive speed especially for their battle cruiser form but then that speed i mean that speed proved very useful and was u utilized quite extensively by lexington and saratoga in their carrier based form so you could say that's a, a successful thing, but then the thing is, I think the speed goes from being very lopsided in their battle cruiser form to being pretty much necessary in their carrier form. Um, you can make equal arguments for something like the Omaha class, which is pretty long lived, um, all things told, and you know doesn't suffer tremendous casualties in World War Two, albeit in somewhat second line roles. They're also pretty darn quick for the average cruiser. The French and Italian destroyers, it's a little bit harder to make an argument for, because although they do get up to some truly ridiculous speeds, um, they don't have the greatest war records, and the speed itself proves to be somewhat less than useful. Albeit that you could look at something like the Tashkent, uh, which was obviously Soviet-Italian design destroyer, and that very definitely was very successful in large part because of its ridiculous speed up until the Luftwaffe caught up with it in dock. Uh, but that's not a problem with its, its sailing speed, so you could make an argument for something like Tashkent. Um, and equally, the Abdiel-class mine layers, a bunch of them, a few of them were lost in the war, but they utilized their high speed to great effect during the war and the fact that they were of a particular size and of a ridiculous speed meant that they actually had quite successful long-term post-war careers as well so yeah when it comes to evaluating a ship that was very successful because it had hilarious speed uh, it's a bit of an open field in my in my book the Fishmaster, YMS91, asks, Can you explain the stability issues experienced by U the US Midway-class carriers as they were significantly enlarged over their service life? Did they lose any speed from the addition of roughly 20,000 tonnes? Now, obviously, a lot of this concerns the post-1950 period, so I'll try and address it as best I can, since Midway is a pre-1950 carrier, but it's definitely not in, the, in sort of the latter part of Midway's career my main area of study. I do know that a few people from the USS Midway Museum are watching, so if you happen to have a bit more detail that could answer in more depth, then please, please, um, you know, comment and uh, let us all know the answers to the mystery. But from what I've been able to determine, um, in terms of speed, the Midway doesn't seem to have lost much, if any, speed during its career, despite all the extra weight being added. Now, there were concerns about the stability as time went on, um, especially towards the end of her career, although it wasn't so much her day-to-day -day stability. The Midway hull design was actually a very stable to start with, um, for not uh, just generally as well as foreign aircraft carriers. She was one of the more stable aircraft carriers, so she had a bit more stability to lose as additional top weight was piled onto her. But there were eventually concerns about all this excessive top weight which might which well it was forcing the ship deeper into the water which was causing issues with sea keeping and her stability was eventually degrading somewhat um 
Although from the report, again, from the reports I've read, it seemed that they were slightly less concerned with day to day stability and perhaps more concerned with the fact that she might not have much of a stability margin left in reserve if she was damaged, which is a slightly different matter. But nonetheless, she was fitted with bulges towards the end of her career to try and address that because the bulges have this wonderful thing that they will both create because they create more buoyancy underwater, they'll lift the ship higher up, which will hopefully improve sea keeping, counteracting some of the extra draft caused by all the additional weight. And because they widen the underwater beam of the ship, they also theoretically serve to increase stability. But it turns out that didn't actually work out too well. Uh, she actually became far more lively uh, in rough seas and moderate seas. And as a result, those changes weren't made to her sister ship that was still in service. But on the other hand, um, it meant that in major storms she actually survived a heel which technically, according to the paperwork, she shouldn't have survived. So, you know, swings around about. So I have a suspicion that what they might actually have done is made the ship too stiff. Um, so kind of gone too far the other way um, to a point that... Um, you had a ship that would be very nice and stable in calm seas, but when enough force was exerted to overcome the stability of the bulges, you started going all over the place. Um, but that's just my suspicion. I'd have to, you know, check and understand a lot more about 1980s aircraft carrier operation than I do at the moment to be fully certain of that answer. Sworn brother of the Ballistic Order of St. John Moses Browning asks, just how far back in history do naval mines go? And what was the first sea mine to successfully sink or significantly damage a ship? How long ago were sea mines conceptualised? So the history of sea mines has kind of a stop start going back about a thousand years. People would perennially come up with the idea of a floating box of explosives that could be used to damage or destroy an enemy ship. Um, most of which were what we would today call command detonated mines, i.e. they had some form of mechanism that allowed them to be remotely exploded because, well, contact detonation, that kind of thing, was usually a little bit beyond the inventors in the pre-industrial age. Although there were a few uh, sort of experimental contact detonated mines that were advanced as ideas. But none of them seem to have gotten very far. A few may or may not have either been used or entered active service in any kind of significant numbers. But as to how much effect they actually had, it seems to be kind of an literally open book because not a tremendous amount is written about them. As far as the continuous history of naval mine warfare goes, that can be traced back to the Crimean War when the Russians deployed a bunch of mines and HMS Merlin, which you can see here, was the first ship in history to, you know, come into contact with this kind of mine, i.e. the modern mine as we would conceptualise it. Um, didn't do a tremendous amount of damage. There were a few other Royal Navy ships during the Crimean War that did take some damage um, from naval mines, albeit they weren't sunk. Although the instances of these mining operations did lead to the world's first minesweeping efforts. So the world's first minesweepers were basically sm small sloops and so forth that were pulled into service to try and get rid of some of the annoyances because a lot of the early mines weren't that powerful, it turned out. It, it, people thought they might work, but it turns out you actually need a bit more explosive to do serious damage to somebody. Now, uh, following this line of modern mines, the unbroken line of mine warfare, USS Cairo would be the first ship to actually be sunk by a mine, um, because obviously mines at the time known as torpedoes were in use in the American Civil War. And then, of course, you had the split between static torpedoes, which we know as mines, and self-propelled torpedoes, which we know as torpedoes. Colin Williams asks, now that USS Johnston no longer holds the record of deepest warship and therefore doesn't need to keep an eye on Kaiju or the Yamato, how long, how much would it cost to raise the Johnston, not factoring in the museum that would have to be constructed around her on shore? Well, the thing is, we actually do know that as a species we have the deep sea 
recovery capability, or at least we have the ability to build the deep sea recovery capability for something that would weigh about as much as a Fletcher class destroyer. In as much as as, as long as nothing goes wrong mechanically, obviously you have the Glomar Explorer, which was intended to recover most, if not all, of a Gulf class submarine. Okay, not quite as far down as Johnston, but considering it's mechanical lifting apparatus, um, five, six, six and a half kilometers, yes, the pressure's going to go up, but for, in practical terms, probably not too much of a difference um, for just purely mechanical lifting devices. So we have, in theory, the capability. Unfortunately, well, the Glomar Explorer itself was first converted and then sold and is now scrapped. So we don't physically have the ship. So you'd basically have to rebuild something like the Glomar Explorer, which ostensibly, if you, depending on how you believe inflationary calculated figures, would probably cost about a billion and a half. So factor in, in the inevitable cost overruns and so on and so forth. And I reckon and probably some slightly more complicated lifting clause to account for the fact that it's not just a very nicely rounded submarine. If the wreck hasn't rusted to a point where it would just fall apart, then you probably need about $2 billion to salvage Johnston. Um, if the wreck has gotten to a point where it's sort of intact as it sits but would come apart if you started to raise it, i.e. you need to construct a, a Mary Rose style cradle for it, then I have no idea how much that would cost because that would then start involving things, well, constructing a custom cradle for it, um, a ship to lower it, plus a, the, which probably will be the recovery ship but don't have to be a much bigger version of the Glomar Explorer, plus you'd need... Um, you need dredging equipment, deep sea capable dredging equipment to uh, you know, dig the ship out enough to be installed in its cradle. And then you'd need some kind of mini sub fleet to go down there to you know, make sure that all these things are delicately done. Because at that stage, there's no way you're going to just do that automatically. Slaman Sam asks, I was wondering if any of the other navies of the interwar period had their versions of the US Navy's fleet problems where officers were able to try out different crazy ideas that weren't always part of doctrine, like King attacking Pearl Harbor using carrier aircraft. So there were, I mean this is pre-dreadnought era, but it's kind of demonstrating a point, uh, the various navies did have traditions of large-scale fleet exercises that they would carry out, the Royal Navy going all the way back well, to the late 19th century and, be, and earlier, but they weren't as regular as the U.S. Navy fleet problems. So in the interwar period, the U.S. Navy, as covered in the, the video, which is kind of the first third of their fleet problems, they conducted a major fleet problem which involved the bulk of the U.S. Navy every year. Japanese Navy, French Navy, Italian Navy, Royal Navy, they did similar scale fleet exercises but not every year and they would have smaller scale fleet exercises and training on a on a yearly basis so it's kind of a swings and roundabouts different ideas were definitely tried out and different results obviously panned out from the different exercises so for example in march 1934 there was exercise zh where the british took their two largest concentrations of ships the home fleet and the mediterranean fleet and effectively took over the Mediterranean for a month, um, charging back and forth, trying all sorts of interesting tactics, which uh, the outcomes of ZH were very, very, I wouldn't say bizarre, but for us looking back in hindsight, they are a very mixed bag. They emphasise, for example, the idea that if you were going to use carriers to strike enemy ships, you needed considerable numbers of strike aircraft, which, you know, the glorious, courageous, furious, eager, eagle Argus Hermes didn't really provide. One of the main reasons why they wanted Ark Royal. Um, but whilst also pointing forward to the idea of you need multiple carriers and you need large numbers of strike aircraft, which sounds very, very modern um, for 1934, they were also coming to the conclusion that, bearing in mind this is a pre-radar environment, that it was entirely possible that when the operational uh, the, the operational constraints 
involved time, i.e. you had to get to a fixed objective by a fixed time, or you had to defend a fixed objective at a fixed time because the enemy was coming for you, basically something where you couldn't choose exactly when and where you fought, weather and therefore visibility could still be a major factor. So large numbers of engagements that were fought during ZH actually involved battleships torpedoing each other at close range in the final stages once enemy ships had battleships had been crippled or um and other in other ways slowed down sometimes including by carrier aircraft because the visibility mandated that actually ships weren't able to spot each other at particularly long ranges and at the shorter ranges while well, letting water in the bottom is easier way of sinking the enemy than letting the water in the top or air in the top so obviously to our minds looking at world war Two, apart from you know rodney versus bismarck the idea of battleships using torpedoes against each other seems absurd but in a pre-radar environment the exercises seem to bear out that this was a thing um also potentially you know helped by the fact the royal navy battleship commanders tended to like to close in on each other as much as humanly possible whilst in training mode at least blasting away at each other Chazix asks mobile dry docks in world war Two. which navies had them and how did they use them how many mobile dry docks were there so in terms of a large mobile floating dry docks that could be taken from place to place at the start of the war pretty much only the royal navy and the u.s navy had them although during the war the japanese navy would acquire some not least because there were two fairly big ones in singapore and when they they were scuttled but the japanese uh, repaired and refloated them what during their occupation of singapore and that's largely because really the the uh, British and Americans were the only ones who needed them because the the two well the two main peacetime roles for floating dry docks were either to supplement the capability of a particular naval base whilst more permanent facilities were being constructed which is why for example YFD2 which held USS Shore at Pearl Harbor but then you also had floating dry docks put into places where a naval base was needed but the local facilities or local terrain wouldn't allow for the construction of a more conventional dry dock such as at Bermuda. Uh, the Royal Navy had a floating dry dock there from the 1860s because it turned out all the rock around Bermuda's naval base was very porous and couldn't be sealed so the only solution to having a dry dock there was to have a, a mobile floating one built in the UK and taken over there. And at Singapore, it was kind of a six of one, half dozen of the other situation where you had a couple of big admiralty floating dry docks there to supplement the capabilities of the Singapore naval base, but they'd kind of also become permanent fixtures because the planned upgrades to the Singapore naval base, which would have included a number of very large permanent dry docks, hadn't been funded. So they were kind of in a, in a halfway state between the two, as I said. Now... Theoretically, you might think the Japanese might have some use for them, but most Japanese operations were easily within range of their home islands up until World War II. Uh, G uh, Germany, likewise, lost all its colonies in World War I. Um, Italy, they had a few overseas bases, but they had dry dock facilities there where necessary. And then once the war kicked off, um, in terms of how many floating mobile dry docks there were, uh, that gets very difficult to answer because the British built a few, but the Americans, as the Americans tended to do, built a lot. And they built a lot of different sized ones. So they built very large ones that could take battleships and aircraft carriers. They built medium ones. They built small ones. They built auxiliary ones. Um, they built some out of concrete because of the steel shortages. <laughs> um, and yeah, they come in all, literally all sorts of shapes and sizes and uh, locations. There's a couple of, I think there's over a hundred total, quite easily, um, that were built, but you know, some of them are only capable of lifting a destroyer or a Omaha or Atlanta, and others, as I say, would be capable of lifting up an Iowa and everything in between. And finally, Andrew Dederer asks, just how much pride did 19th century naval officers have in their near monopoly on navigation? Whilst the calculations are fairly complex, aren't most of them already done in navigation books? Was this monopolization some sort of defensive reaction to engineering officers? 
theoretically things like sun sites and star sites are able to be computated into a navigational books yes um at which point taking the sites themselves becomes a fairly teachable skill the problem that you run into with that is that navigation is not just taking sites and then working out your position uh, navigation is also at that point dead reckoning um, being able to estimate how far you've gone using you know the tides if any currents if any sea state um, and of course the speed and direction and course log of your ship because you may go for significant portions of time where you don't actually have any access to either the sun or the stars and there, there are ways of getting past cloudy days for certain types of navigational sighting but a it's going to be slightly more imprecise and b um doesn't help if you if it's cloudy night <laughs> with no moon so you have to learn all of those kinds of navigational principles as well because otherwise i mean it probably doesn't make too much odds if you have a couple of days of heavy cloud if you're in the middle of the atlantic or the middle of the pacific and your last known coordinate was a thousand miles away from anywhere and you're only traveling at 12 knots but if you were say a day out of port as in your day away from getting to port and you've traveled overnight and you know there's been wind there's been waves there's been cloud and you have no real exact idea where you are because you can't take a, a star site or anything but you know that perhaps in an hour or two you might be fetching up on the coastline that's when you need to be really 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 good at dead, dead reckoning navigation um, in order to you know keep your ship safe so yeah there's a fair bit of complexity involved but monopolizing the navigational skills to a certain extent could be seen as a reaction to engineering officers um in, in an attempt to keep sort of basically the command track and the engineering track separate because to a certain degree you can see the the surface logic you know and what does an engineer need to know about navigation he's going to spend all his time down in the bowels of a ship um so only the the quote-unquote command track officers need to know that and the flip side of course being if something happens to all those officers probably help to have somebody who who's usually spends all of their time behind feet of armor to know how to navigate the ship um and of course it, as i say it does take a little bit of time to learn these things which again you could make an argument is you know something that engineering officers should be spending their time learning the engineering of their ships and not a skill that they might only need in extremis so yeah there's, there's a little bit of of a defensive reaction going on there but by and large at least the surface logic holds even and i suppose you could make the also make the argument that if every navigation trained officer on the bridge and elsewhere in the upper works of the ship has been killed you probably aren't looking at a circumstance where you need an engineering officer to come up and navigate the ship you're probably hoping that engineering officer is going to keep you afloat long enough to abandon ship well i suppose at that point you then have to hope you someone knows how to navigate the boats but never mind if there's still any boats around and that brings us to the end of the dry dock episode 204 part two thank you very much for listening um if indeed you still only made it all the way to the end of this and i uh, hope to see you again in another video no particularly significant channel admin for this week fortunately so uh, well done and enjoy the rest of your day wherever wherever and wherever you might be